Good morning. Uh, my name's Alistair Chapman, and in the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to go through uh, this camera here, the F5 and also the F55, and look at some of the features of the camera, and particularly uh, how I use it in a run-and-gun situation. So not your typical drama-type shooting, but out in the field doing uh, documentary-style production. This is actually my own personal camera here, uh, rigged up uh, how I use it. And I'm going to go through how this is all set up and uh, a few things like that. So lots to get through in the next 45 minutes. Now, I'd, first thing I'd like to say is I don't work for Sony. I'm not a Sony employee. I am uh, part of Sony's ICE team. Uh, you can probably tell from my accent that I'm not local. I'm from the United Kingdom, based near London, and I'm a Sony ICE there. And ICE is independent certified experts. So we don't work for Sony, but Sony bring us in for events like this to help out on the booth and stuff like that. Now, I am a DOP. I've been filming and shooting uh, broadcast television for over 20 years. I also do uh, commercials for television and for cinema and supply footage for feature films and movies as well. Um, my speciality is severe and extreme weather. So tornadoes, hurricanes, things like that. Also other natural extremes like the Northern Lights. So before I go any further, I'm just gonna give you a little taste of the kind of thing that I shoot with a clip. And this is some footage from last year shot with this camera as it's set up now in this configuration. So let's have a look at this clip. So uh, that's, uh, that's what I enjoy shooting. That's what I shoot a lot of. Uh, the uh, tornado there was uh, in Kansas, in Bennington, in uh, May last year. And so why shoot with this camera? Well, I want to shoot in 4K. I do a lot of stock footage, and I sell a lot of stock footage into movies and features. So quality is everything to me, and getting that very, very best picture quality is paramount. And when the F5 and 55 came out, it gave me the opportunity to upgrade to go to 4K at a reasonable price point, but also with a package and a form factor that works very well for that type of shooting. You wouldn't normally associate a digital cinematography camera, which is what this was originally designed as, with that kind of shooting. But as well as being able to shoot in 4K, there's lots of other benefits that I get with this camera. So I can shoot 
uh, at up to 240 frames per second for super slow motion and it has an incredible dynamic range. These storm shots, you're dealing with very dark clouds, very bright skies, big dynamic range. And really this camera is the first camera that I've had that's really been able to capture that uh, like a photograph really. So it really has raised the quality level of what I'm doing. Um, the camera is modular and this is one of the really great things about this camera. So one really nice thing, I'll actually show you quite a few of these features on the camera is right now I have a EF mount Canon lens. So that's a Canon DSLR lens on there, but I can actually change this lens mount. So that's the lens mount. And this is a EF adapter that's on here right now. The camera ships with a PL adapter, but because that mount is so quick and so easy to change, you can put a huge range of lenses on here. So in EF mount right now, you have some great lenses from Canon and from Fujinon. You have the Fujinon Cabrio lenses, uh, 19 to 90 millimeter servo zooms, and the new Canon 7x17, a 17 to 120 millimeter zoom. These are beautiful lenses, really nice, but they're kind of expensive. Uh, this one's around about $33,000, and this one's a little bit more. I think it's about $39,000. That's a lot of money for a lens, and I'm working on a tight budget, so I need to have some other choices. Now, one choice is you could use uh, an adapter to use a standard ENG B4 lens on this camera. The camera has two distinct shooting modes. One is full frame, where it uses that full super 35 millimeter sensor, and the other is crop mode. And in crop mode, you're just using the middle super 16 size part of the sensor. It's still full 2K and HD resolution, 4K resolution with the full sensor, but that crop mode allows you to use a very uh, low power adapter to convert your two third inch lenses to fit that Super 16 frame, or you could indeed use a Super 16 uh, lens on the camera. So lots of options there. But the one that I use uh, a lot is, moving on, um, is this one here. Canon or Nikon DSLR lenses. So this is a Canon EF lens, a Canon EF mount lens. The adapter is an electronic adapter that controls the aperture in this case. If you use a Nikon lens, you can use a mechanical adapter that you don't need to use the electronics with Nikon mount lenses. Now the image quality that I get with these lenses is very, very good. You have to consider that a DSLR lens is aimed at photography and shooting very, very high resolution still images. So you do get full 4K resolution with these lenses. And again, you have lots and lots of choices within the DSLR type of lens. Uh, lenses that I use, I use these uh, Rokinon or Samyang Cine Primes. They're based on DSLR lenses, but they're fully manual and they have the pitch gears for your follow focus and things like that makes them very easy to use. Um, this is a lens, it's not available yet, but this is a lens that I've got my eye on. It's the Tamron 16 to 300. That's an 18 times zoom lens. Uh, it's around about, gonna be around about six, $700. So that's not a lot of money to spend for an 18 times zoom. Uh, another lens I use a lot is the Canon 24 to 70 millimeter L series. You have a huge amount of choices of lens that you can use with this camera. And that really sort of helps you uh, to pick and choose. So when I'm doing the storm chasing, I have that big zoom range so I can get the wide shot and the close up shot without changing lenses. Uh, tornadoes, things like that, they happen very, very quickly. So you haven't got a time, time to fiddle around swapping lenses out. So you need that big zoom range. So, I mentioned earlier that there are actually two cameras in this range, the F5 and the F55. Now, I chose the F5 because that fitted within my budget. I had a, a, a fixed budget to work with, and I couldn't afford everything that I wanted with the 55. But what is the differences between the cameras? The majority of the features are the same. The image quality is largely the same. The 55 has a slight edge. But the key thing is that the F55 can record 4K compressed using the XAVC codec onto the S by S cards in the camera. The F5 can only record HD internally. Both cameras can shoot 4K RAW. So with this box on the back here, this is the R5 RAW recorder, I can shoot 4K RAW with either camera. So even my F5, even though it can't do 4K internally, I can still shoot 
in 4K with the camera. Um, I can also, uh, with the F55, you have a sensor that has something that Sony called frame image scanning, more commonly referred to as a global shutter. Now, CMOS cameras, the sensor is scanned from top to bottom. And that can give you problems with when you pan very quickly because there's a very slight time delay between the top and the bottom of the image being scanned and you get skew. The image bends very slightly. And most of the time you don't notice it. You certainly wouldn't have seen anything in that footage I just showed you that's going to cause a problem. But with the F55 camera, that problem does not exist because of this frame image scanning system. The same with flash photography. With a standard CMOS sensor, you get flash bands. But with the global shutter of the F55, no problem at all. All those artifacts go away. The other thing the F55 has is a super wide color gamut. Now, what is a color gamut? The color gamut is the range of colors that the camera can capture. Now, uh, television standards, so this TV will comply with Rec. 709. It's actually a very small range of colors. Both the F5 and F55 cameras exceed the standards for television. And in fact, the F55 exceeds the standards for movie film production. So this has this capturing, uh, especially the far reds and far greens, these subtle shades and colors that most video cameras don't normally capture. It's a very, very broad color gamut. And that gives the, the colorist in grading and in post-production more to work with. It gives the colorist a bigger palette to work with. Now, one of the nice things with these cameras, because one of the things that makes these cameras so versatile is the fact that you can use them in this multitude of roles, is that traditionally when you buy a video camera, it has one codec inside and that's it, and you're stuck with that codec. Well, these cameras from day one had two codecs, which was MPEG-2, uh, same as XDCAM422, uh, and also XAVC, which is a next generation 10-bit codec. Now, XAVC is very uh, interesting because it can do HD, 2K, 4K, high speed, up to 240 frames per second, possibly faster in the future. It's a codec that can grow and a codec can, can, that can go forwards. It's also now being included in a lot of other Sony cameras. So PMW 400, PMW 300 will get XAVC going forwards and it's a codec that is also creeping down into the consumer end as well. Some consumer products now have XAVC-S in them, a, a long got version of XAVC. So this is a codec that's becoming very, very common and it's actually very easy to work with. Very small, compact files. In 4K at 24 frames per second, XAVC is only 220 megabits per second. Now that's the same as that well-known codec from Apple in HD. So it's really easy to work with. Now, talking of well-known codecs from Apple, you'll see that I've got ProRes listed here. This is coming as an option. ProRes and DNX HD will be available as an option for these cameras going forwards in the future. You'll be able to buy an upgrade card that will slot in the camera and will also give you ProRes and DNX HD. Really makes this camera very versatile because there, there's no workflow that it won't fit into with that range of codecs. And of course, we mustn't forget, even though it's not on my slide here, that we have RAW as well. And we can actually record uh, XDCAM or XAVC and RAW at the same time. And that, for me, is a really fantastic workflow because it means in the field when I'm shooting the storms, I can shoot RAW, 4K, really, really high quality for my archive, for my stock footage, and at the same time I can record XDCAM, XDCAM HD for news. So if I shoot a breaking news story, a big tornado, I can FTP the XDCAM to the news stations, weather channel, whoever, and then they'll use that. Nice, small, easy to work with files. And then for my clients that want the ultimate in picture quality, I have the raw material once I get back to base. So, oh, there we go, raw. Uh, the nice thing about RAW is it's linear RAW. So you're actually capturing the world the way it really is. And the benefit of that is effectively you're taking the scene that you're shooting into your edit suite. And you can make all your color choices and your grading choices in post-production. Um, for me as a cameraman, it actually makes it really easy to shoot with, really easy to work with, because I don't want to say you can be lazy with your exposure, but exposure, things like that, are a lot less critical when you shoot in RAW compared to shooting in log. So it really makes my life very easy. 
So there we are, MPEG for news. Uh, another uh, application for this camera actually was I took it up to the Arctic to shoot the northern lights. And I'm just going to show you a few little moments of that. I'm not going to show you a, a huge amount of that. So we took it up to, um, to Norway in uh, January of this year, uh, shooting the northern lights. Let me just skip forwards a minute through here. Here we are. So one of the nice things, we can do time lapse with the camera. Now, when this was shot, it was cold. It was very cold. It was about minus 34 degrees. So this is done with S and Q motion, time lapse. Um, in version 4.1 of the firmware, there will be a full interval record option on the camera. Right, and this I'm not is Ravna Stewart. I'm going to show you all of this. Uh, but what I want to show you here at the end is this footage here is of the Northern Lights, the Aurora. This is real-time video of the Northern Lights. This is not time-lapse. This is what the Northern Lights actually look like when you watch with your own eyes. To shoot this, you need a super-sensitive camera because this is not bright. Um, but the F5 2000 ISO is its native ISO. And that allows me to actually shoot the Northern Lights, shoot the Aurora in real time without having to resort to time lapse. Most of the time when you see the Northern Lights and the Aurora on TV, you'll be seeing time lapse with exposures of between one and 10 seconds. So you don't see all these fine details and the, and the very fast motion, the rapid motion that you do sometimes get uh, in the Aurora. And you can see I'm, I'm actually panning the camera here. I'm using a two-frame shutter, so it's equivalent to the one-twelfth shutter, so it's a little bit blurring. But normally when you see a time-lapse of the Aurora, you don't see this kind of motion. Only a real-time video can show you that. Okay, so I'm just going to come out of there. There's lots and lots I want to try and get through today. So, okay. The camera has two distinct shooting modes depending on what you're doing. And this is one of, another one of its great features. If you're shooting a movie, shooting a commercial, a fashion shoot or something like that, it has a cinema mode, a film style shooting mode called Cine EI. Then at the same time for traditional documentary type, type production, news, anything with a fast turnaround, you have a different mode which is a standard mode, or sorry, custom mode. Now, custom mode is just like any other ENG camera mode. You have scene file settings, you can use different gamma curves, you can change the matrix, you can choose the way the camera looks in the camera, and you create your look in camera. All those settings can be saved on an SD card, and they can be recalled at the touch of a button. You can actually uh, recall, if I press the file button here, we can actually recall camera setups instantly from the memory card, from the SD card in the camera. So that's very much an ENG style shooting mode. Very, most people find that very familiar and very easy to get on with. But we also have this Cine EI mode. And Cine EI mode is all about getting the maximum dynamic range out of the camera and getting the very, very best image quality. So when you're in Cine EI, you will use S-Log2, S-Log3, which is a new S-Log curve from Sony, or RAW. You use lookup tables for monitoring because S-Log2 and S-Log3, they look very flat. It looks very uninteresting and it's actually very hard to judge your exposure with S-Log2 and S-Log3 because the exposure levels are relatively low. S-Log2 middle grey is only 32%, so everything looks really dark and really flat. And that makes it hard to judge by eye your exposure. So you use lookup tables for your monitoring. And instead of changing the gain of the camera as you would with a traditional camera, we change the EI, the exposure index. And the next few, I'm going to go through this stuff with you and take you through this stuff because this is going to be unfamiliar to most people coming from a broadcast background. This is very much a film type of workflow. So I'm actually going to take you through it on the camera in a minute. Now, one of the really neat things with this camera is the lookup tables now. You can create your own very quickly, very easily, using Sony's RAW viewer. So while I've got the laptop plugged in here, I'm just going to jump into Sony's RAW viewer software. So this is completely free software. And although it's called RAW viewer, it actually works with not just with Sony's RAW, but also with XAVC uh, and STP, HDCam SR, from the camera. So if I want to create a lookup table, all I need to do is open up a clip 
Now this clip was shot using S-Log3. It's quite flat looking, quite washed out. Um, it's actually a little overexposed, but uh, it was part of a camera test where we were testing the dynamic range of the camera. And uh, this look, you wouldn't want on set. A lot of directors, producers would freak out saying, oh, it, it, it looks a bit milky, it looks a bit washed out. So what we can do is we can create a lookup table and it's really easy. All I have to do is here, I can use these tools that are here on the right hand side of the screen here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the contrast image using a curve here. So I'm just going to bring the blacks down, make it uh, a bit darker in the, in the blacks and then lift the mid range up make it a little bit more contrasty and then I'm going to warm it up a little bit so I'm going to put a bit, bit of warmth into the shot and just shift my colors just over this way a little bit I have to look there we go and we can just warm the shot up a little bit and there we have something that certainly looks a lot better than without the look applied and then to save that as a lookup table all I do is I go to the Save button here, sorry, Save As, and I choose Camera LUT here. I give it a name, I'm just going to call it NAB, and Camera LUT for an F5 and 55 LUT Media SD. Now what the Media SD is, it, what happens is when you save the file, it creates the correct folder structure that you then put on your SD card. And click on Save. And that saved my lookup table. Then what I would do is I'd simply copy that onto an SD card like this one. I'm not going to do it right now. I don't have time, copy it onto the SD card and then you load it into the camera and that same lookup table will be available to use in the camera. It's really that simple, it's really that easy, it's very straightforward uh, to do you, and it's all free software, you don't need to do uh, anything uh, special. Okay, so I'm going to unplug the uh, computer now and plug into the computer because I'm going to look at Cine EI, how you expose using Cine EI and then we'll look at the lookup tables in the camera. So just bear with me while I do this. We did rehearse this and try this, so it should all work. Fingers crossed. It's one of the advantages of having a camera with an HDMI cable is that it does plug into all of this sort of stuff. Right, so. And there we go. Right, so that's the uh, camera output. There we go. So. Cine EI. What is Cine EI all about? Well, the first thing we have to do to use Cine EI is we have to be in Cine EI mode. So the camera is in Cine EI mode. And then coming up through the menus, I have to turn on my lookup tables. So on my viewfinder, on my video out up here, we come down to monitor LUT, monitor lookup table. And Currently they are off, but I'm going to turn my lookup tables on for the HDMI output, which is what we're looking at now. And if you, I don't know if you notice the contrast change then in the background of the picture, I'm also going to turn it on for the viewfinder, like that. Now normally you would leave lookup tables off for your internal recording. You don't normally want the lookup table being burnt into your recording. The lookup table is a tool for your monitoring that allows you to to see or to visualize what your graded image will look like. But you don't normally want to burn that into your recording. So we leave it off for the internal recording. We have a choice of lookup tables. There's two different categories of lookup table. So at the top here we have LUT, or we have a look profile or a 3D LUT. So LUTs, we can create LUTs or we can create, sorry, we can create look profiles or use a 3D LUTs. Now a LUT, um, in Sony speak at least, on this camera is a technical lookup table. So it's converting from one color space to another. So if you're shooting in S-Log, it will convert that S-Log into Rec. 709. And it's a very precise uh, mathematical equation that gets from one color space to another. A look profile or a 3D LUT is basically 
just a look. It's creating a look. It doesn't comply to any specific given standard. So you can be much freer, much more creative with those. And a 3D LUT allows you to change your saturation as well as your contrast, whereas a single 1D LUT like this is basically just a contrast change and a, a, a contrast shift. So let's have a look at what that LUT has done. So if I just, um, we're going to use uh, LUTs for the moment for this demo. Turn the menu off. Nice contrasty picture. See how much contrast we've got in there now. If I turn the LUT off, and I can do that from the side panel. I press the camera button two times, and then on the side panel here, I tell you what, I'm going to come around the front so I can see what I'm doing a bit more easily. And I'm just going to turn the LUTs off, and that's without the LUT. And in fact, if this was exposed correctly, this is S-Log3, middle gray would be down there somewhere. That would probably be my correct exposure, somewhere around there. And then that's with the LUT on. But you can see how much more contrasty the image is. So once we've got our LUT, I'm in 709 now. What I'm monitoring, what I'm seeing now, because this is the um, 709 LUT. Let me just check that it is. Yes, 709 LUT. So I'm now viewing this in 709. My waveform monitor that's on here is measuring the LUT output. Not the recording, what I'm recording, but the actual LUT output. So all my exposure judgment now is based on 709. So when I expose this, I look at this picture and I can expose this by eye. Because basically I'm looking at 709 exactly the same as if you were shooting with a normal traditional 709 video camera. And as a result, what you want is a picture that looks nice on the screen. You don't have to worry about your middle gray and all of those things so much. You can just look at the picture, and if it looks right, well, then it probably is right. So 709, using that LUT, makes exposure much more easy. And you expose your levels as you would for 709. So if you're exposing faces and skin tones, they would be between 60 and 70% as you would expose normally. Whereas when you shoot with log, faces and skin tones are typically around uh, 40, 50 percent. They're much, much lower. And it's very difficult for people to, to shoot like that if they're not used to it. So that's lookup tables. So that's our first step in this shooting mode, is the ability to add a lookup table. Now, the next thing that we have is Cine EI and exposure indexing. Now, this is kind of difficult to get your head around because it's, it's kind of a weird way of working if you're not used to it. So right now, the camera is currently set, in fact, I'm going to put the camera to its native ISO, 2000 ISO. So this is the camera's native ISO, and in fact, that is why I was surprised about by the exposure. Right, so if I expose that just by eye, looking at this and with the waveform, 709, correct exposure. Would, would we all say that's correctly exposed, yeah, more or less? Right, now let's turn the LUT off, because I was in the wrong mode. Right, so that's my S-Log3 exposure. It's quite flat. If we look at the white levels, they've come down. Um, and my middle gray is probably around about 32%. Put the LUT back on. Much nicer picture. You see the way the white levels come up? Look at the peaks on the waveform here. And we turn the LUT off. They're much lower. Because the picture's so flat, overall the picture looks brighter with the S-Log, because it's all very flat, has no contrast. But when we turn the LUT on and we add contrast, even though our levels go up, overall the picture seems to look a little bit darker because we're, we're changing our contrast range. Anyway, so Cine EI, how does this work? The camera always records at the native ISO in this mode. So the native ISO of this camera, F5, is 2000 ISO. So it's always going to record at 2000 ISO, no matter what I set the EI to, the exposure index. But I don't want to always shoot at 2000 EI. Now, one of the things I can do with this is I can manage my noise and my dynamic range of the camera. Now, if you want to have less noise in your picture, if you take a picture into grading, into post-production, what would you do if you want to reduce the noise, other than noise reduction? What about making it brighter? What happens when we make a picture brighter? Well, the noise gets brighter, so you see the noise more. What happens if we make a picture darker? Well, the noise goes down, we see less noise. Now, what Cine EI does is it allows you to overexpose deliberately 
so that when you take your footage into post-production and they grade it, they bring the levels down and the noise goes down with it. So what I, if I want less noise, what I use is a lower ISO. Now let's, this, is, this is the tricky bit here. So I'm going to go one stop lower on my ISO. So I'm currently at 2000, so I'm going to halve my ISO to 1000. What happened to the picture? It got darker. That's what you would expect, yeah? You have a lower ISO, the picture gets darker. I haven't changed anything else, just the ISO. So what would you do as a cameraman cinematographer in response to that? Open the aperture. If you were shooting with a light meter, and I changed my light meter settings from 2000 to 1000 ISO, the light meter would tell me to open the aperture up by one stop. So I've lowered the ISO, the EI. In response to that, I open up my aperture by one stop to correct. Now what's happening to my recording? My recordings always happen at the native ISO. So I've opened the aperture by one stop. So what's happened to my recordings? They've become one stop brighter. So when that then goes into post, they will grade it down and my noise will be one stop lower. I'll have 6 dB less noise. It's actually a dramatic difference. It really makes a big difference. A lot of your noise, basically, by doing this, your noise just goes away. I could go another stop lower. I could go all the way down. Let's go down to um, 640 EI here. And I open up again by another stop to compensate. And if we now turn the lookup tables off and look at the recording level, so this is the, the output after the lookup table. Now let's turn the lookup table off. Much, much brighter recording because the recording is still happening at that native ISO. So in grading, in post-production, they'll bring those levels down, the noise will go away, I'll have a super clean picture. And one of the biggest restrictions of grading and any color correction is actually noise. 10-bit, uh, 12-bit, 16-bit, that's all important, but noise is your big killer when it comes to grading. A noisy picture is really difficult to grade well. But by using a low EI and rating the camera at a lower ISO, you can get a much lower noise picture. Now, Anybody notice the fact that we're still not even close to overexposing? This camera has so much dynamic range, 14 stops of dynamic range, that I can do this and I can get away with it. And in fact, on the side of the camera, on the camera display, just here, it tells me what my overexposure headroom is at all these different ISOs. So right now it's telling me I have 4.3 stops of overexposure latitude, which is still quite a lot. That's a really reasonable amount of overexposure latitude. If I go back to 1000 EI, I get five stops. And if I go to 2000 EI, I'll have six stops of overexposure latitude. So the other thing that the EI does is it alters your latitude range, where you sit in your latitude. So the camera always has 14 stops of dynamic range. If I go to a lower EI, the low ISO, I lose headroom, but I gain in the shadows. Remember, my exposure is getting brighter, so I'm seeing further into those shadows. So if you're shooting a low key scene, and this sounds a bit weird, but if you're shooting a low key scene, a low ISO will really help you out because you'll see further into the shadows. You don't need as much highlight room with a low key scene as a rule. If you're outdoors shooting on a very bright day, you might need extra headroom. And in that case, you could raise your EI, go up to maybe 3000 ISO, and that will give you extra headroom at the expense of seeing into the shadows. So EI does two things. It alters your midpoint of your dynamic range, shifts it up and down. And because it's shifting that midpoint up and down, it allows you to manage your and choose how much noise you want in your pictures. At the native ISO of 2000, the camera is very, very clean anyway. But if you go down to 1000 or 800 ISO, it's super clean. The same with the F55. When I use these cameras, I tend to rate them at half of the native ISO. So the F5, I'll typically shoot with this camera actually at 800 EI and with the uh, F55 at 640 EI. So it's a really uh, nice way to shoot that really gives you uh, a great flexibility. Right, so I'm just going to switch back to the 
to the uh, laptop for a minute and uh, swap the cables back over. So, PMW F5 and F55. I've just talked about EI, which is largely a, a cinema mode, but the presentation is about run and gun. Now, one of the things that I've found is that the EI mode, because the, the way the exposure works is so versatile and so flexible, especially with the lookup tables, with the 709 lookup tables, or with the custom lookup tables that you can create yourself in RAW Viewer, it's actually a really easy way to shoot. Because you have so much exposure range, you can be much freer with the way you expose. When you're shooting ENG style, if this camera is in the custom mode and you choose a 709 codec to create a nice look in camera that will look great on the screen straight away, you actually have to be very precise with your exposure. I'm sure we all know that if we're shooting with a traditional video camera, if you go a stop over on an interview, the face goes all horrible, the skin tones don't look nice. In the EI mode, when you're shooting with log, you have 14 stops of dynamic range. If you're accidentally a stop overexposed, it doesn't really hurt you. It, it's barely noticeable. They'll just sort it out in the grade because you have that big dynamic range. So it actually makes it much easier to use for run and gun. The downside, of course, is that it does shift a lot of the budget in your production to post-production. You've got to allow for some post-production time. So why do I like this camera? You can use almost any lens you want, in summary. It's shoulder mounted. It's a really well balanced camera. So I have a radio mic in the back, sits on my shoulder. It's really easy. I can use this on my shoulder, very stable, uh, easy to use for a long time. I actually have a little control here. I can actually uh, focus the camera from down here through the lens mount that I have. Makes it very easy to use. Um, choose the lens that you want and it's a really nice camera to use if you haven't seen it on the booth Sony have just announced there's a, a prototype of it here their own shoulder mount system for this camera for ENG and that has a shoulder pad like this and where the R5 raw recorder is is a section that comes up here that has audio controls and that gives you audio control instead of using the, the one on the side the XLR connectors then come onto the back of the camera. On the side of the camera here, you have a panel with switches for your white balance, some extra assignable buttons, and then your, black, your white balance buttons under the front of the camera. So just like a typical ENG camera. So that's now coming from Sony too. You can choose whether you shoot with shallow depth of field or not. In full frame mode, the camera is a super 35 millimeter sensor and you'll have that shallow film like super 35 millimeter depth of field in crop mode where we're just using that super 16 part of the sensor our depth of field is very similar to a two third inch eng camera and just by pressing a button on the side of the camera i can flip between those two modes um, i can create something in the camera that's called an all file and an all file remembers, it's a snapshot of the way the camera is set up at that moment in time. You can save, uh, I'm not sure how many actually, but it's, it's, it's more than 30 or 40 of them on a card. You can have lots and lots of them. And just by assigning those to these buttons on the side, you can switch between different modes of shooting. Very easy to do. So I can switch between full frame and crop mode very quickly. And when you change between full frame and crop mode, your depth of field effectively shifts from being film style depth of field to video style depth of field. So if you're doing news where you want a deeper depth of field to make focusing easier, you can have that at the press of a button. Um, so it's a really nice camera to use. Codec choices, raw recording. Uh, raw recording, I shoot almost everything raw now. And frankly, I wouldn't want to go back. Raw, once you, you start using raw, is really nice to work with. There's so much information in the picture. It's 16-bit linear raw, so it's a huge amount of information compared to a 10-bit uh, compressed codec. Uh, one thing to say about raw is don't be afraid of raw. Sony's 4K raw is designed to be very, very easy to work with. It's compressed. It's visually lossless compressed three to one. And what that means is, so if we're shooting in HD, and I shot HD 
uncompressed. Can anybody remember what, know what the bit rate for HD uncompressed is off the top of their head? Well, it's around about 1.2 gigabits per second. It's a lot of data. The raw from this camera is just under one gigabit per second in 4K. So I can shoot 4K raw and my files are smaller than if I shot in uncompressed HD. And I can edit that 4K RAW on this laptop. And the, the video you saw here was edited on the laptop in the field, on location, graded with Resolve. It's a MacBook Pro Retina. So Sony's RAW is very, very easy to work with. So don't be afraid of RAW. And because it's linear, one of the benefits you have with linear recording is you don't have a knee, you don't have a gamma curve. So your exposure latitude is much greater. One of the problems with um, traditional shooting is you'll either have a knee or a gamma curve to squeeze a bigger dynamic range into your recording bucket. And if you overexpose, that compresses the highlights and it doesn't look nice. With RAW, with the linear RAW, there's no gamma curve. You can expose really, really brightly, provided nothing's actually clipped, you'll be able to grade it and recover that footage just fine. So in summary, did I say, of course, one of the reasons why I like this camera is beautiful pictures. The pictures I get from this camera are stunning. It's, and it's a camera I love using. It's very user friendly. It's enjoyable to shoot with. And if you're a professional cameraman working with your camera day in, day out, to have a camera that you actually enjoy working with is so nice as opposed to a camera that you're fighting with. It always feels to me that I'm working with this camera and I'm not fighting against it. So that's PMW F5 and F55. If you've got a, you might want to take a photograph of this or write this down. If you have one, want to know more about them, are interested in them, Sony have a community site for the website here, uh, community.sony.com. You'll have to write it down. Um, lots and lots of information there about these cameras. That's where you'll find all the information about the updates coming for these cameras. Um, I write uh, workflow guides and user guides for the cameras on my website, xdcam-user.com. Um, and if you fancy some storm chasing, you want to come and shoot some of the, the stuff that I like to shoot, come join me in May. I'm running a workshop, a 10-day documentary production workshop in the field, storm chasing. And it's normally a lot of fun. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, come and grab me after the session. So we've got a little bit of time left for questions. So anybody got any questions about the camera? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so, so what's the difference between yeah. RAW and S-Log? It's a very good question. So RAW, uh, let me see, have I got any clips I can show uh, quickly grab? I, I don't. I'll, I'll dig some out for the next session, so it's a good question. So RAW takes the RAW camera sensor data. It's not processed. It's just taking as it comes off the sensor and records that data. Nothing's done to it in the camera. So basically, you're taking, it's, it's like taking the sensor out of the camera and plugging it into your computer. So in effect, because I'm taking just that raw information directly into the computer, because it isn't processed, because it doesn't have a gamma curve, because it doesn't have log, because it's nothing to it, I have everything there in the computer when I do my grading. So my highlights are exposed with just as much information as my shadows. Now, when you use a gamma curve, an S-Log, S-Log 2, S-Log 3, they are gamma curves. To squeeze, what, what you have to remember is that when you're shooting with a compressed codec, it's a 10-bit recording in here. So you have a 1,000 data levels, roughly. It's actually a bit less than that, to record from black to white, a 1,000 shades. The raw is 16-bit, and I can't remember how many millions of shades that is, but it's millions of shades. Now, if we want to squeeze millions of shades, into just a thousand shades, we've got to squash stuff. We've got to throw stuff away. Now, what we don't want to throw away is the important stuff. We don't want to throw away information about faces, people, because that's what people will notice. You know, if I was to really compress faces, the viewer would notice it. So with any type of gamma curve, what they do is they'll compress the highlights, throw away a whole load of information about the highlights, because we don't notice it, the viewer won't notice it, Maybe compress the shadows a little bit as well, because again, the viewer won't notice it much. Keeps the middle bit OK. Now, that works very well. And this is S-Log or S-Log 2. That works very, very well, provided you expose it correctly. If you overexpose it, 
those faces or that important information goes into the top part of the curve where it's compressed and you start throwing away data. So suddenly the face, it, might, it won't necessarily look overexposed, but what you lose is all the subtle textures in the skin tones because you, you, you've thrown away a lot of information. So the more you overexpose with log or with any gamma curve, you start throwing away textures and fine details. With raw, that doesn't happen because you have those, these millions and millions of levels of shades. You don't need to throw any data away. So I could expose a face at 99%. Provided it wasn't clipped, I can take that into the grading suite and I can grade it and it will look perfect. Whereas with a traditional gamma curve, if you were to try and shoot and expose somebody's face at 99% and then grade it back, it's not going to look good, I can assure you. It's going to be really washed out and, and, and lack contrast. It won't look nice. You need lookup tables for both. So, so S-Log will have a lookup table applied to it to bring it from S-Log to 709 to take it from that flat look to looking like traditional video. If you're going to show it on a 709 monitor, if you're doing it for the cinema, you'd use a P3 lookup table, takes it into a different color space for cinema production. With RAW, what happens is that, um, depends on the software that you use, but what will normally happen when you bring the RAW into your grading package or your editing package, because you can't actually see and work with the RAW anyway, it, it would be meaningless to try and work directly with the RAW, a lookup table will be applied by default. So if you use something like DaVinci Resolve, you go into the Resolve Preferences, and if you go to the Sony RAW tab, you'll see that you can actually select different lookup tables in there. So, but that a, a lookup table will be applied by default, because if you don't, you can't really work with RAW. Whereas S-Log, you can kind of edit it without a lookup table if you choose to. And, and some production companies, some people do choose to work with it that way. That answers your question. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of differences between S-Log and RAW in terms of grading because uh, actually RAW is easier to work with than S-Log. And the reason for that is that S-Log is not linear. Now, uh, just to expand on that a little bit, actually. So Sony have now two S-Log curves in this camera. You have S-Log 2 and you have S-Log 3. S-Log 2 is an engineering masterpiece. And it, gets, it squeezes every last bit of information out of that sensor into a 10-bit codec. But it's an engineering masterpiece, not a creative masterpiece. It's a fantastic achievement from an engineering point of view, but to work with it in grading is a nightmare because it's a big curve. So none of the curve is straight. And what that means is, and this is, with, this is the problem with log, is because everything is applied on a curve, if you make a change to the bottom of the curve, what happens at the top of the curve is different because it's not a straight line. So when you have a very big curve, it means that small changes at one end will have a different effect at the other. And that can make log difficult to grade. And this is actually why with log, one of the ways to work is to use a lookup table, which converts it to something that's a much straighter line. And then you grade the straight line. So if you make a change at the bottom, the same change happens at the top. Now, two curves in this camera, S-Log2, which is an engineering masterpiece, and a new curve, S-Log3. S-Log3 mimics a, a very well-known curve called Cineon, which happens to actually be very similar to the curve that ARRI use in their cameras. And the reason this is actually very, very nice to work with is because the bottom of the, of the log curve is a curve, but the top is a straight line. So once you get from, the, from about, I think it's about 40% upwards, it's actually a straight line. So when you grade, for most of your grading tweaks and adjustments, you'll have the same effect in the middle and, and the top. And it actually makes it much, much easier to grade, much faster to work with. So that's one of the reasons why you know, S-Log3 is very good. S-Log3 also puts a lot more information into the shadows and into skin tone. So when you're trying to pull stuff out of the shadows, there's more information there. The downside to S-Log3 is that if you, just, if you were just to A and B switch between S-Log2 and S-Log3, the S-Log3 out of the camera will look noisy. It isn't. It's an, it's an illusion. The reason it looks noisy is because the, 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 the low levels, the greys and the shadows are lifted to put more information in there when you shoot. That makes it appear more noisy. But after you've graded it and normalized the levels, all that noise disappears. It's, it's not noisy-er. It's just it's an optical illusion that you get. 
So a lot of people get put off by, oh, I'm not using S-Log3, it looks really noisy. But if you do a test, if you take S-Log2 and S-Log3 and grade them the same, the end result is identical in terms of noise. So don't be put off if you see noise in S-Log3. Uh, but RAW is linear. It's a total straight line from the blackest black to the brightest light. So any correction you make at the bottom has exactly the same effect and everywhere in between. And much easier to grade as a result. So any more questions? Yes, sir. Okay, PL adapters for the different lenses, are there any uh, loss of light? Uh, it depends on what you're adapting to. So PL, obviously, no change there. EF, Nikon, no change there because they're full frame or super 35 millimeter or APS-C, whatever lens you're using, but they're that size, the large size of sensor. If you want to put a 2 3rd inch B4 lens on here in full frame mode, you have to make the image circle, the, the image projected by the lens, two and a half times bigger so you lose about two and a half stops. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds though because this camera is about two and a half stops more sensitive than a typical two third inch camera. So you come out kind of equal at the end of the day. In crop mode, if you want to use a two third inch lens, you need about a 1.35 times magnification. So you lose about three quarters of a stop, which is really very, very small. It's like you wouldn't really notice that. So it depends on the lenses that you, you want to use. Any more questions? No? Great, well I hope you learned something. Um, there's loads of these cameras around the booth in various places. Um, we have an event tonight, a Cine Alta event, and I can't for the life of me remember where it is. Um, <laughs> so, hmm? is it a Mirage? And I can't remember what time either. I'm supposed to be there and I don't know what time. Seven o'clock, I'm being told. Seven o'clock at the Mirage. So if you want to know more, uh, see the new shoulder mount adapter and things like that, do come along this evening for that. Um, be most, what you'd be most welcome. So thank you for listening. Um, websites are here. If you have any other questions, I'll be hanging around for 10 minutes or so before I disappear. Thank you very much.